you to stand up with us and we'll look at the Word of God together. Now, Philippians chapter 1, and we'll begin reading this evening in verse number 3. Philippians 1 and verse number 3. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. If you love His Word, say amen. amen. While you're turning there, I want to remind you of our 40 days in Philippians. We're reading, I believe it is, 15 verses a day out of the book of Philippians. And we're doing that every day. And in the course of seven days, you will have read through the entire book of Philippians. And then we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again throughout the next uh, 40 days. And I want you to enter into that with this boy. Every time I have read out of Philippians, God has spoken to my heart. And it may not be all 15 verses, but a verse or two just jumps off the page. And every reading, God has ministered to my spirit, and I trust that he is yours as well. So do that. Make a note of that. Seven days, 15 verses a day. And let's enter into Philippians together. Philippians chapter 1. And we're going to read beginning in verse 3. And verse 3 begins a thought, a sentence. And it actually runs complete through verse 7 before we find a period marking the end of Paul's thought. And that's why we'll read these verses. Philippians 1, verse number 3. Paul said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. I want you to go back to verse 6. It will be our theme tonight, so let's read it. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it, until the day of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you tonight for the precious word of God. Thank you for the church that is gathered. And Lord, that they have come with hungry hearts, with expecting spirits, open Bibles. And God, I pray that you'd fill us now. You said if we hunger and thirst, that we would be filled. And we do hunger for your word. We thirst for your spirit. And so God, do that work tonight. I'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Now, I made a public statement on the church's Facebook page today. And I made you a promise that I wouldn't do what I did last week. I preached 51 minutes last Thursday night. And I make you a promise I'm not going to do that tonight. So it'll either be 50 or 52 minutes. Can I get a witness right there? I'm a man of my word, and I like to stand by those promises. I do want you to look tonight at the text that we have read, and I want to remind you that Paul is sitting in a Roman jail as he writes the book of Philippians. He is literally sitting in a Roman jail under the watchful eye of a Roman guard, of a prison guard. But yet, Though Paul is 800 miles away from the little town of Philippi, his heart is in that city. Isn't it amazing how our bodies can be in one place and our heart can be somewhere else? Yeah. For instance, some of you, your body is here, but your heart is at McDonald's. Can I get an amen? Or your body is at the job, but your heart is on the beach. I can say amen to that. We can be one place, but our heart is somewhere else. And Paul is in a Roman jail, but his heart 
is 800 miles away with the saints in Philippi. Now, 26 times in chapter 1, 26 times in chapter 1, Paul uses a form of you, your, or ye. The personal pronoun referring to you. In one form or another, 26 times, Paul mentions you, your, or ye. I would like to remind you that the theme of Philippians is joy. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. And I think the fact that Paul is in prison, but yet he is thinking of others, may indicate to us that joy does not come from being consumed with our own circumstances, but rather in thinking of others in their situation. If you want to be miserable, just get obsessed with yourself. Amen. If you want to be miserable, just get hung up in what's going on in your life. Paul has every right to be throwing an old-fashioned pity party. Any of y'all good at throwing pity parties? I promise you, I'll get cake, a hat, and everything. I can throw a pity party with the best of them. But Paul has every excuse to do that. But in this dire situation, he is not talking about himself. He is talking about others. And he is not thinking about himself. He is thinking about others. This is not the bulk of the message. But you may want to write this down. Real joy comes from thinking of others more than ourselves. 26 times he speaks of them. Now, it is interesting that Paul would say these things about Philippi and that he would have Philippi on his mind because in, in reality, the experience of Paul at Philippi were not pleasant experiences. Now, a lot of you will be familiar with this. Do you remember, and you've heard preachers preach on it, about Paul and Silas singing at midnight in the jail. Does that ring a bell with anybody? And at midnight, Paul and Silas began to sing praises unto the Lord. That happened in Philippi. Now, why did that happen there? Because Paul was arrested under false charges. He was beaten openly in front of the community. He was then placed in stocks and put in the innermost cell of the Philippian prison, which would be uh, the hole, so to speak, on complete lockdown. That happened at Philippi. He does not have fond memories of the city of Philippi. But you see, Paul's heart is not caught up in the place. Paul's heart is caught up in the people at Philippi. He remembers the Philippian jailer that got saved that night that God broke him out of jail. He remembers Lydia, that merchant woman who sold and produced goods and, and fabric and dye and how God saved her and she was on fire for God. There was a demon-possessed girl in Philippi that followed Paul and, and mocked and, and, and proclaimed what they were doing. And finally Paul had enough and he turned around and he cast the demon out of her. Don't you wish that you and I could get aggravated enough just to cast the demons out of people? I mean, if you got some folk at work, you wouldn't mind trying that. Oh, yeah. Somebody said at work, preacher, I rode with them to church tonight. <laughs> that's, between, that's between you and the Lord and them. But Paul got so aggravated that he finally stopped, turned around, cast the demon out of her, and that girl got saved. So Paul is not thinking fondly of the place because it was a pretty rough place. But he is thinking about the people that are there. I know some of you take notes. I see you got your pen out and your notebook out. And others of you put this in your phone. And so I want to give you three little thoughts. This is not the heart of our sermon. But I want to give you three thoughts about Paul thinking about these saints in Philippi. Notice in verse number three, we see his remembrance of them. His remembrance of them. Verse three. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. We 
see Paul's remembrance of them. Let me just say this. I want to be the kind of believer, and I'm going to need some help right here. I want to be the kind of believer that when others think of me, they thank God for the relationship that we have. I want to be an encouragement, not a discouragement. Man, I'm just going to be transparent with y'all tonight. I did the funeral for David yesterday, and uh, boy, that was just emotionally tough and worrying about Miss Kitty and praying for her. And then all of that that goes along with that and dealing with some other issues and trying to help some people and praying about some situations. And man, I, I was just, it was an emotionally taxing day yesterday. Y'all ever have those? Just emotionally taxing. And last night we were invited to a birthday party. And we got to the birthday party and there was a bunch of the folks from the church there. And uh, now we did, I did have a plate full of ribs, so I mean, I don't know which one it was that helped me so much. But when I left last night, I was so encouraged. And as I, I went to get Dalton, he was at another church, and I went to pick him up and all the way to pick him up. My heart was just full, and I was happy, and I was rejoicing, and my day turned around, not because of the ribs, but because of being with the saints of God. Amen. And thank God, I want to be that kind of believer that brings joy when other people remember me. We right. see his remembrance of them. Then we see in verse 4, his request for them. He said in verse 4, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making requests with joy. Paul said, not only do I remember you, but I have requests for you. I pray for you. Let me just stop and give you a little practical piece of information right here. When somebody asks you to pray for them, or when you tell someone that you're praying for them, make sure that you actually pray for them. Right. Now, I get texts on Sunday morning. My phone, I get up early about every day. But Sunday mornings, I get up about 4.30, 4.45, and my phone will already have text on it when I get up. And all Sunday morning long, it'll blow up with preachers and missionaries and other people in the ministry. And they'll text and say, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for the services. Now listen, I don't know how many of them really are. But I've often thought, if I've got as many people praying for me on Monday as I do on Sunday, I'm going to make it. Amen. Amen. Now I don't know how many of them really are. But if you tell somebody, I'm going to pray for you, stop right there. Bow your head. I mean, riding down, if you're driving, don't bow your head, just keep, you know, but, but pray. And really follow through with that because prayer changes things. Yep. And if we are in the middle of discouragement, we ought to think of others and we ought to pray for others. Amen. His request for them. But then notice thoroughly, write this down, not only his request for them, but I want you to notice his relationship with them. He said in verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. He said, we have a relationship, and that relationship is fellowship. Now, let me say this about fellowship. I heard a preacher say one time that fellowship is just two fellows in the same ship. But I would like to disagree with that because I've been in the ship with some folks I wanted to throw out of the ship. Amen. My son's one of them. I need a witness right there. We go fishing. We go out in the Gulf. Man, we get 30 miles out there. And I, sometimes I, but Marty's been, I'd throw him over, but I know I'd feel bad. I'd have to go back and get him. Wait, it's a long ride out there. So just because you're in the same ship doesn't mean that you're in fellowship. I'm not going to preach this because I've got to get to the heart of this message. But Paul is referring to the Philippian church. These are people that not only stood up for him, he said that you are at, we read it tonight, at the defense and confirmation of the gospel. He said, you stood up for me. And then they gave financially. When nobody would give, the Philippian church gave financially. Ladies and gentlemen, fellowship is more than just going to the same church. Fellowship is more than just going to the same heaven. Fellowship is a friendship and an investment and a defense of one another. And Paul said, I have a relationship with you. And that brings joy in the middle of my suffering. Now, 
We see his relationship with them. But number four, I want you to see, this is our message tonight. I want you to see his reminder to them. Now, verse six, let's look at it again. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice that Paul's reminder to them, and if you don't get anything tonight, get this. Paul's reminder to them is that God is working in their life. Amen. You see, Paul said, if I was persecuted in Philippi, they're probably going to be persecuted. If I was tormented for the gospel's sake, there's a chance they'll be tormented for the gospel's sake. That's why he longed to go to them. That's why he longed to survive his prison sentence so that he could help them. But Paul said, no matter how hard it gets, and I want you to hear me tonight with more than just your ears and more than just your brain. I want you to hear me down in your spirit. Know this, no matter how hard it is, God is working in your life. Amen. He is working in your life. You may not understand how, and you may not know why, but Paul reminds every one of us to be confident that he which begun a good work, he is going to finish it. I wish I could just, I wish y'all could feel this the way God gave it to me. God is working in your life. He's working individually. He is working in your life. Amen. He's working. Now I want to look at this work. And I want to look at verse 6. I want you to notice the confidence of this good work. He said being confident of this. Now the confidence of this good work means to have full belief, trust, or assurance. Paul said, hey, church at Philippi, you may not be able to see it right now. You may not be able to feel it right now, but be confident that God is working in your life. I'm gonna just I, I'm gonna testify, and if you agree, feel free to holler amen. I don't always see God working in my life. I don't always feel God working in my life. But I have enough Bible to stand by faith, and when I cannot see it, and when I cannot feel it, by faith I will believe it that God is working in my life. Amen. A believer that is confident that God is working will keep coming to church even when the songs don't stir their heart. A believer that is confident that God is working will read their Bible even when verses don't jump off the page. A believer that is confident that God is working will say, Lord, this trial is hard. This valley is deep. But I'm not giving up because I believe that you are at work. Right. Paul said, be confident of this. In the 1930s, they began construction on the Golden Gate Bridge. Has anybody been and seen the Golden Gate Bridge? A couple of you. When they began construction on the Golden Gate Bridge, it was built in two phases. When they were doing the first phase of construction, listen to this, 23 workers fell from the structure and died in the water beneath it. 23 men died falling from that job site. As they completed the first phase, they sat down and had a meeting and said, something's got to change. This is not going to work. We can't continue to do it this way. So they paused construction on the bridge and they built the largest net that the world has ever seen. They strung that net from one side to the other where the men were working. And during the second phase of that project, only 10 men fell from the bridge. And out of the 10 that fell, none of them lost their life. Now they did have to go home and change clothes. Somebody say amen. <laughs> but none of them lost their life. Now this is what I took away from this. 
The second phase of that construction was completed in three quarters of the time that the first phase was completed. They were working slow because they were working scared. They were working slow because they were operating in fear. They were working slow because they went to work with one fellow one day and he didn't come back the next day. And it caused them to be leery. It caused them to be hesitant. And it took away their ability to function because they had no confidence. But when the net was in place, they worked faster because they were fearless. They worked harder because they were fearless. They worked together because they were fearless. And I want to say to somebody tonight, you may not see it, you may not feel it, but there is a big safety net under us. Good. And God is working in our life. I may fall, but thank God, He'll be there to catch me. Yeah. The situation may fall apart, but He'll be there to catch me. Good, Others may let me down, but He'll be there to catch me. And now I am confident that God is working in my life. That's good. Romans chapter 4, verse 20. Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Abraham was 100 years old. His wife was 90. And the Lord showed up with a gift certificate to babies are us. How many of you got that kind of faith? I ain't got faith to see a hundred, let alone have a baby in a hundred. But Abraham believed God. And Abraham staggered not. And did you know God didn't fulfill that promise that night? God did not fulfill that promise in nine months. But in the fullness of time, God brought it to pass. And I've come to tell somebody tonight, be confident. God is working in your life. God is moving on your behalf. You may not see it. You may not feel it. But leave here tonight and say, Devil, you're a liar. Situations, you've come and gone. But he's been faithful. God is working in my life. That's good, man. Hallelujah. I've got more Bible. But that would put us playing around with that 51-minute mark. <laughs> Number two, write this down. We see the, the accumulation of of this good work. The accumulation of this good work. Notice what he says in verse number 6. Be confident of this very thing that he which hath begun now watch a good work. Now, let me talk to you about the accumulation of this good work. This good work is not our good works. It's not our good works. As a matter of fact, it's not even the good works that we started when we got saved. This good work is the salvation that God gives us. I'm going to need an amen right here. If there's anything good in our life, it's because God put it there. Amen. So this good work, and I've got more proof for this. This good work is salvation. You know how I know that? Because if it was a good work that we had... Paul wouldn't say, I'm confident that you're going to finish it. How many of you have started a lot of things that you never finished? I mean, I, you know, when we talk about commitment around here, I'd just be glad for the day when y'all start clapping at the beginning of a song and make it to the end of the first chorus. Amen. <laughs> The Browders was here. And I watched some of y'all back there. I mean, y'all get to clap. And about the middle of the first chorus, you're out, man. I mean, I got like 20 claps in me a year, and I just used all of them up. Talking about dedication and commitment. We struggle to clap all the way through a song. I, I can't make it through a game of Monopoly. Somebody say amen. How many things have we started that we don't finish? And so Paul's confident because this is not us finishing this good work. It is God. And if it was our work, we would be responsible to finish it. But the good work is not what we do. It is salvation that God has put into our lives. Amen. Let, me, let me give you this and I'll move on. Notice this. This good work is salvation. Write this down somewhere. 
Our salvation is threefold. It's threefold. You want to write this down? Salvation is threefold. It is the work God does for us. For us. That is redemption. I could not wash my own sins away. Hallelujah. I could not repeal my record of guilt. But thank God, redemption was God's work of salvation for me. And he washed me and he cleansed me. And he made me a new creature when I got born again. Amen. Salvation is the work God does for us in redemption. Secondly, salvation is the work God does in us. Write that down. In us. That is sanctification. I mean, if you know when I got saved, that God washed my sin away, but he put the Holy Spirit inside of me to help me in my daily walk to become more like Christ. Yes. That is sanctification. Then, number three, salvation is the work God does through us. That is our service. Through us is our service. Ladies, when you serve in that nursery, that is service, and God wants to work through you. Men, when you serve at the church and you usher or you sing or you work on the property and the facilities, whatever your job may be, that is our service. And it doesn't need to be a work of the flesh. It needs to be God working through us. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. How many of you would agree that that we, and I'm not, I'm not we enjoy a spirit-filled preacher? Amen. We got Brother Kenny Kikendall coming in a couple of weeks. You know why Brother Kenny's coming back to greater life after several, several years of revival? Because he is a spirit-filled preacher. He is an educated man. He is a wise man. He's written books on top of books on top of books. But we're not bringing him here because of his uh, uh, human wisdom or because of his own abilities. We're bringing Brother Kenny here because he is a spirit-filled preacher. Man. I'll be honest with you. I don't want to hear a preacher unless he's a spirit-filled preacher. Man. That don't mean he's got to scream and shout. He can whisper. He can talk in a monotone. But if he's got the Holy Ghost, you don't know it. Yeah. And we like a spirit-filled preacher. But let me say this. God likes a spirit-filled Christian. And just like you want a spirit-filled preacher, the Lord wants a spirit-filled vacuumer. The Lord wants a spirit-filled nursery worker. The Lord wants a spirit-filled singer. The Lord wants a spirit-filled security team. The Lord wants spirit-filled people to count the money. The Lord looks for spirit-filled believers because that is Christ's salvation working through us. That's good, brother. Through us. Through us. Okay? All right. This is the accumulation of this good work. This good work is salvation, but it's threefold. It is redemption, it is sanctification, it is service. It is God working for us. It is God working uh, in us, and it is God working through us. Number three, look at this, verse six. That he which hath, can y'all say that word with me? I'm like, can everybody say that word good and loud now? That he which hath begun a good work in you, Will, say this out loud, perform. Say it again, perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Number three, notice the completion of this good work. It is God which hath begun this work in us. The, the phrase, which hath begun, it means to commence. It literally means to perform the first act. Now let me just set you straight on something right here. You and I did not go looking for God. He came looking for us. Amen. I was not seeking God. God was seeking me. Amen. You said, but preacher, I had, I had uh, an inquisitive spirit. I had a desire. I wanted to be saved. You know why you had that inquisitive spirit? You know why you had that desire? You know why you was pursuing it? Because before you pursued him, he was pursuing you. So no matter what you think or what you saw, the Bible says there is none that seeketh after God. The Bible says in 1 John, we love him because he, help me now, first loved us. It is he which hath begun a good work. God is the opening act of this work in our life. 
And then he goes on to say, he which hath begun a good work, what did we just read? Will perform it. Now, the word perform means to complete. It literally means to complete. It means to commence. It, it, it means to bring a close. May I say to you tonight that the Lord Jesus is not only, hallelujah, he is not only the opening act of our salvation. Thank God he is the closing scene of our salvation.